Hello, in this video we're going to be talking a little bit about z-scores. So z-scores are actually a measure of um, relative standing actually, but they make use of both the mean and the standard deviation, so we had to postpone talking about them until this point in our playlist. So a z-score is also known as a standard score or standardized score, or standardized value, uh, maybe a standardized variable. Um, so what it does is it uses the standard deviation and the mean to get a measure of relative standing. And because of this, it allows us to give a rough comparison between items of different types. It's unitless, so it, the units really don't, don't come into play at all. Uh, or they cancel out, I guess, in the computation of it. If you think of looking at finding a, a bunch of uh, data and then computing z-scores for one sample and another z-score for another sample and so forth, the z-scores for all the different data values will have uh, a mean of 0 and a standard deviation of 1 if you look at the distribution of the z-scores themselves. So the z stands for the number of standard deviations a data value is above or below the mean. So a z score of 0 means the value is the same as the mean, a positive z score means the value is above the mean, and a negative z score means the value is below the mean. And the way you compute it is you just take the data value minus the mean and then you divide by the standard deviation. So we might do that for a sample. I'll use a lowercase z for that. That would be x minus x bar over s. So here I'm using the sample mean, x bar, and the sample standard deviation, s. I use a capital Z for the uh, population version of this, which is x minus the population mean, mu, divided by the population standard deviation, sigma. So it's basically the same uh, formula both ways. So notice in either case, the numerator is how far um, the value is above or below the mean. Of course, if x is larger than the mean, that'll be a positive numerator. And if x is lower than the mean, that'll be a negative numerator. The units of the denominator, the units of the standard deviation, are the same as the units of the numerator, so those cancel out and give us just a um, unitless measure here. And so this allows us to compute uh, things that are maybe different from each other and give us some sort of comparison. So, uh, for example, if you if you uh, measured a height, it wouldn't measure if you wouldn't matter if you measured your height in centimeters or in inches in terms of computing a z-score. So um, the x say measured in centimeters or or in inches. And then the x bar would be 2, so the numerator is in inches. The s is, in, is also in inches, and that would divide out and be unitless. If you did the same thing in centimeters, again, it would divide out. So the, the numerator then is how many inches or centimeters it is above or below the mean. But when we divide by the standard deviation, then we're saying, well, how many standard deviations above the mean or below the mean is that value? So in that sense, it's a measure of relative standing, so it's seeing how how many standard deviations the data value is away from the mean. So let's look at an example. So um, here's an example, and it's an example of how we can use z-scores to give comparisons of somewhat unlike items uh, by producing a unitless measure of relative standing for each of the two distributions. So here's our example. Uh, Elizabeth scored 234 on a standardized test of writing where the population of students taking the test had a mean score of 125 and a standard deviation of 32. She scored 123 on a standardized test of mathematics, which had a mean score of 95 and a standard deviation of 7. Did she perform better on the mathematics test or on the writing test? Now notice that um, her score, raw score, of 234 on writing was much higher than the uh, raw score of 123 on mathematics, but maybe they're not even out of the same total amount. Okay, so we don't even know a percentage that she got right. And then even if we did have percentages, that still wouldn't tell us which one was actually the better relative to the other 
uh, students taking the tests. So what we can do though is we can find the z-scores and then compare them. So what I would like you to do is to use that formula that we just had. Let's review real fast. The data value minus the mean divided by standard deviation. Use that formula to find a z-score for the math test and a z-score for the writing test and then decide which one is better based on looking at the z-scores. So go ahead and compute those and compare them and come back and check your work. Press pause now. Well, again, the basic formula is x minus x bar over s uh, for this sample. So her score is x, which is 234 on the writing, minus the mean on the writing. Let's see, the, taking the mean on the writing was 125. And the standard deviation of the writing scores was 32. So if you subtract, remember this is subtract first and then divide, and that turns out to be about 3.4. And the z-score for the math is similarly computed. We use the score on the math that she made, which is 123, and the mean score of the math, which is 95, and the standard deviation of the math, which is 7, divide that out as 4. So what does this mean? This means that on the writing test, she scored about 3.4 standard deviations above the mean on the writing test and about four standard deviations above the mean on the math test. In fact, that's extremely good. Uh, this puts her most likely way, way, way up in the top scores on both tests. So this is a, a extremely good score in both cases, but the one on the math is even better than the one on the writing. So relative to the other students, uh, taking the test, her math score was the better one. Okay, at the end of this video, I want to review just a couple of things here. So let's just review some of the measures that we've gone over so far, um, and a couple at the end that we'll be, we will be going over in the next couple of videos. So first of all, we talked about measures of size. We talked about frequency, relative frequency, cumulative frequency, and cumulative relative frequency, and we looked at those in terms of tables. And then graphically, we looked at them in terms of histograms. We also looked at dot plots, box plots, and circle graphs. Okay, really the box plot actually really is more of a measure of relative standing than size. I should uh, delete that, so let me do that. Okay, and so those are some measures of size. Now, we also have measures of relative standing. The most basic ones we looked at first were just the minimum and maximum, the extreme values. Then we also looked at the median, and the, the, those three values were the half tiles, dividing the data into halves. And then we did the five quartiles, including the minimum, maximum, median, and then Q1 and Q3. And those five numbers divide the data into fourths. And then similarly, we could do deciles and percentiles, dividing into tenths and hundredths. The box plot was a graphical representation of the quartiles, so it's a visual representation of measures of relative standing. And what we just went over in this video, z-scores gave us another measure of relative standing. Now we also talked about some measures of central tendency, uh, probably in the order that uh, they are most used. We see them here. Notice they all start with the letter M. Mean, median, mode, mid-range, and mid-quartile. So these are all different ways of measuring the middle, center, or typical value or average value. The measures of variability that we looked at were range, interquartile range, variance, and standard deviation. And coming up in a few videos, uh, a video a little bit down the line, we'll be talking about some measures of shape. So there we're talking about bas the basic shape if we looked at, say, a dot plot or histogram. And well, one of the main things we might look at is symmetry, if the grass is symmetry or not. If it doesn't uh, have symmetry, then it's what we call skewed, so we could talk about the skewness. And we might refer to some several shapes, not only symmetric and skewed, but J-shape, mound shape, bimodal. And we'll talk a little bit about those. And let's review some of the basic formulas for we have corresponding formulas both for sample statistics and the corresponding thing for population parameters. Uh, for example, just using the sample size, just count up how many items are in the sample, 
that's lowercase n, but if we could count the entire number of items in the population, that will be uppercase n. The mean is found by uh, adding up the data values and divided by how many you have. So if that's a sample, we call it x bar. And then we're summing up the x sub k's from 1 to little n, and we divide by the little n. The corresponding thing for population is uh, called mu, with that letter right there, mu. That's the population mean. And it, again, it's found by summing the data values and divided by how many you have. Uh, so that's the sum from k equal 1 to capital N of x sub k and divide by capital N. In either case, the mode is the most often occurring data value. The median, which we'll use x tilde, um, and we also use uh, for, for a sample, see a little squiggle above the x there, or a capital M we'll use for median here. Some people use a, people use a Greek letter eta for the median for a uh, lowercase eta for the middle ranked value there for the median of a population. So basically, if you remember, what we do is we put our data in order. We rank it from lowest to highest, and we find the data value that's basically put cuts it in half with half below and half above. Mid-range, then, we could find by doing minimum plus maximum divided by 2. And the mid-quartile, you do quartile 1 plus quartile 3 divided by 2. That's the same for a... For a uh, um, sample or a population. We get to variability, the range, usually we use a capital letter R for that. A lowercase r is reserved for something later called correlation. So a capital R is maximum minus minimum, uh, same for a population or for a sample. The interquartile range is the distance from the between the lower quartile and upper quartile between Q1 and Q3, so it's Q3 minus Q1. Same for both. The variance is where we first get a uh, kind of a, a, a difference in the formula uh, other than just different le letters for it. Okay, so But they're almost the same. The variance of a population over here, let's start with that. We use sigma square for the variance and sigma for the standard deviation for a population. And sigma square we find by taking the x values, x sub k minus the population mean mu, then we square them, then we add all of them up from 1 to capital N, and we divide by capital N. In other words, we're, we're averaging or finding the mean of the uh, squared deviations. Okay, And then just simply take the square root of that for the population standard deviation. Now remember, we can only use these formulas if we know for sure that it is a full population. If it's not a population, then we're looking at a sample, which we want to be able to estimate the population variance or standard deviation. And so it, remember, we modify the formula. Instead of this being n, it's n minus 1 here. So of course, it's lowercase n because it's a sample. But then it's also minus 1. Otherwise, the formula is the same for the variance. And then similarly, square root of that is a standard deviation. And we use s for the Again, for the sample standard deviation, sigma for the population standard deviation. So almost all the time, we're going to be using S because most of the time you're actually given a sample. If it's specifically, you know it's a full population, then of course you'd use the sigma here. And what we just went over in this video, relative standing of z-score is found by doing x minus x bar over S in the sample or x minus mu over sigma in the population. So it's just a quick review of the basic techniques and formulas. Uh, see a little bit earlier video for a little bit more detail about the media and how you do that. But we've uh, worked with these before, and it's just a quick um, slide that kind of summarizes a lot of these uh, formulas together.